Uh, hello, everyone. I feel like I've met everyone in this room now, so you all know that my name is Jacob, I hope. Um, I translated this book to Archipelago Published. Um, I don't know who whistled, but thank you. Um, I'm going to just read a little bit from it um, from the middle, so I'll try to explain some context uh, without like boring your brains out. Uh, so, it's kind of like this book is just full of flashbacks. It doesn't really have a linear plot. And so this chapter is set in the 1970s after Franco has just died. And the narrator is sort of this like <laughs> countercultural, he's sort of like a countercultural person, like very, like he has his hair dyed and everything, which just like stands out a lot of the time. And he's with. What um, color? <laughs> green, I think. He's in a David Bowie face. Yeah. Um, and so he's with this Argentinian woman who has basically fled Argentina because she's a very like active left, 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 left wing person against the dictatorship. And they think that Madrid is probably the worst place to be when like all of the police in the world are in Madrid. So they're going to go back to Galicia, where he's from and where he hasn't been in a long time because he sort of hated his parents' bookstore. I don't know why. He's just a rebellion. <laughs> it's a lot of dad stuff. Um, <laughs> And so, like, basically, they're going to go back just to, like, have to give her a safe place to stay. And so the context is that they're at the train station, and he's calling his dad, who is very talkative. Um, oh, and her name, just for also context, is Garua. She's next to me, outside the phone booth at the Estación del Norte. Since the day we met, our roles always had been and always would be reversed. She inside, holding the earpiece the way she always did creating a mask with her hands and hair so that no one could see her, curling her body up inside the phone booth on the street corner, on the street corner four blocks down, the one farthest from me, as she engaged in long spells of listening and confidential conversations I would never know anything about, and from which she would return frailer and smaller, her almond eyes gradually widening in a growing hallucination, which would make me think she, just, she didn't just use the booths to talk, but also to see images, cartoons, sequences, Hence her body language, using her hands as a shade against the light. She looks at me, stares, rather. She puckers her lips. She's sending me a birdsong kiss. She once said to me, my mother tongue was chirping. Hello, Sanctum Regum speaking. I say, I'm coming back. This is great, because I left my mom. I'm going to be. We will have to cut this out. <laughs> but Sanjuri is all about the roses. Uh, no, I don't want to talk again. Oh, I'm tall. <laughs> is it? Okay. Uh, Sorry. Is. I'm coming back. When? Today. I'm about to board the Atlantic Express. My father didn't seem surprised, neither by the fact that I was speaking to him, nor my clumsy communication of the trip with one foot already in the stirrup. It's the best thing you could do, son. Do you remember the story of the dead man on the balcony? I got anxious. It was the wily, talkative polytropos on the phone. That's a nickname for his father that you obviously don't have context for. Uh, meanwhile, she approached the glass of the phone booth and started making comic gestures, ending with a parody of a toothpaste commercial. If anyone asks you what I'm like, she had joked, tell them I have perfect teeth. My father was plowing ahead with his story. A true story, of course, about a man who died and whose mourners couldn't get him out the front door because his coffin was too big. So instead, they decided to lower him down from the balcony. I'm with someone, they cut in. Terra Nova will always be a land of asylum, he responded without a moment's thought in the jolly tone of someone who just signed a truce. Uh, Terra Nova is the name of their bookstore, also. Uh, I was taken aback. Why had he used that expression? A land of asylum. It's a girl, I said. A woman. All the better, he said. And you know what? They tried every alignment imaginable. Horizontal, vertical, but they just couldn't get that coffin out the door. Talk to you later. I'm going to miss the train. As I left the booth, while she contentedly stretched out her arms, it hit me that Polytropos had been expecting her. It was an intuition, the vision of a traveler at the ends of the earth. They didn't know each other. It was the first time my father had heard of her existence, of the woman accompanying me to Terra Nova. I could see her. I'm seeing her now. And I could see him, alone, returning to the desk in the pinhole chamber, opening his journal and writing down his great feeling, 
she arrives tomorrow. And the intuition and the intuition that alights in my mind may have something to do with the day we first ran into each other at Café Comercial, when the Mirasol book caught her eye and she agreed to accompany me to continue the conversation, that was how I put it, and come up to my apartment, to no one. It's just men, I said. There's only men living there. Little men. All gnomes. That's right, we live in a gnome cave. But it's a feminine cave, she said after she saw it. I must have turned pale as a sheet when she said it. I'd heard my father elaborate a similar hypothesis about Paleolithic cave paintings, located in, in, in nearly inaccessible crevices, mouths that were hidden for millennia, fissures, cracks, vulvas, he said, through which to enter the belly of the earth. Their bodies had to be well-trained. Their eyes had to be adapted to the dark, even if they had torches. Their fertile gazes impregnated the shadows with, with these marvelous creatures, some blind hands, the hands of witches, of midwives, he said. And though he signed his work under a pseudonym, the usual polytropos, even when it was published abroad, this article sparked a major controversy in the esoteric realms of art and archaeology. It was women who painted the caves, I said to her that day. That's the Fontana theory. And I said it like that, the Fontana theory, the way we would speak of the long dead Darwin. Women and girls with the talent, the rare mastery. Just look at the hands, at the size and shape of the markings. There are handprints in most of the caves. He says it was their signature. But it was a signature that meant more than just that. It's the open hand technique. According to him, this was the first avant-garde act. You can see the outline of the painting hand better than the hand itself. And that empty hand has mystery to it. The illusion that there's something on the other side of the wall. She looked at her hand, at the palm of it. Of course there's something on the other side. I was at ease with, the, I was at ease with her on the train opposite me. Within minutes, I started to feel as if we'd been traveling together a long time and had finally found love. It wouldn't be much longer. Besides the ticket checker, a policeman would always make the rounds of the train asking to see identification. In the cozy rocking of the car, this was the only uncertainty that stole my calm. When the plainclothes officer appeared, she handed him her passport first with a convincing smile. These policemen would generally keep the documents and return them only as the train was reaching its destination. If they were night owls, this was plenty of time to thoroughly inspect the documents spread right before them. Are you stressed? She asked. No, I'm fine. You were definitely stressed in the phone booth. I could tell. That's because they asked if you knew how to sew. He laughed. <laughs> and what did you say? That you've been sewing since, since the day you were born. She suddenly turned serious. And I was suddenly afraid that she'd stand up and walk out into the corridor, leaving me alone with the other two passengers a married couple who wore the dictator's funeral on their faces. But no, I still couldn't see that she was the kind of person who never took a break from the labor of feeling, despite the image she conveyed of impenetrable tranquility, of immunity to imbalance. It's true, I was born so. My mother was a seamstress, a percalera, as they're called in Argentina. She was from Barracas. A typographer and a seamstress, those were my parents. I know how to tie my shoes, too, if you can believe it. My father picked up the phone, I explained. It's been a long time since we'd spoken. She had to understand that. But he acted as if nothing had ever come between us. He was always so terse. At that day, he was ready to talk my ear off. He kept trying to tell me a story. A story? Yes, the story of a dead man, I whispered. A dead man whose mourners couldn't get him out of his home. And? And what? And, she says, whispering too, what happened to the dead man? How should I know? I didn't let him finish. The train was about to leave and he was sitting there blabbering about how they couldn't get the coffin out the door. I had to hang up. We had to cover our mouths with, for, with our hands for a few seconds to contain our laughter. No, actually I do know it. The story? It was a long time ago. Back when I was in the Iron Lung, my uncle Eliseo would tell me these, these, those kinds of stories. It was a form of shock therapy. Abject shock, he said. They decided to try lowering the dead man out by the balcony, but the coffin slipped out of their hands and broke to bits on the ground. There was no one inside it. So? There was no one in the coffin. <laughs> but Che, what happened with the dead man? Oh, him? He was clinging to the balcony for dear life. <laughs> 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 um, hi everybody, my name is Sam Rutter. I'm a writer and a translator. 
I had the pleasure of meeting Jacob at a translation conference a bunch of years ago, so it was nice. It was nice to um, be invited to be up here with you. I've also been asked if I could read a little something in translation, and as fate would have it, it's for a book that I'm long overdue turning into Jill. Right? <laughs> anyway, so it's it's all in the house. So I'm going to read. Now that you've done the work, I'm, I, yeah. it shows I'm doing my work. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. I'm reading from the work of Ebe Uhan, who a, was a really beloved writer and um, writing teacher from Argentina, passed away a couple of years ago. Um, her, her writing is often very short and a little bit weird. I, I think, you know, if it was a cocktail, it would probably be two parts observation, one part flight of fancy. So there's a bit, I think, of overlap too in terms of, you know, um, where the language comes from. So. This is a very short story called Lives from the collection I'm working on, so I'll just read it out. In one of her incarnations, she was a gardener, but a storm destroyed the garden, and so now she just plants willy-nilly. Because, you know, if everything gets destroyed again, this time it'll be fine. But she never forgot about the Scolopendra bendix, a little grey centipede that's much faster than earthworm. It was sacred, and that's why she never squished them. In another life, she was a panhandler. That was back when they used to use the term vagabond, and vagabonds slept in the hollows of trees. This is why she can never quite get comfortable in her house. It always feels too big, and so the space she doesn't use feels dead and abandoned. She'd prefer to have a single tiny room with a low ceiling. In her next life, she was a member of the Council of Elders who sat in judgment over the rest of the tribe. Here are some of the things she disapproved of. Lack of courage in battle, pissing on the sacred oak tree, spitting into the fire or at seabirds, and sitting back with your feet on the table. She let the sun and the wind, and the direction of the wind guide her in these judgments. If the sun was a bit iffy, she'd delay her decision and think on it again when the sun seemed sharper. The same thing with the wind. It was impossible to make out anything from a gentle breeze with tiny whirls. Now she's part of a panel of women that sits in judgment over men who abuse women, women who fail to care for their children, children who respect neither their parents nor the frogs in the garden, the frogs in the garden who fail to perform their duties, the garden that just creates more work and work that creates more stress. But when the sun is iffy and the breeze is gentle, a member of that same panel might say, to combat stress, there's nothing better than a salt bath or a brisk walk in a green space. And that's how the crazy folks avoid judgment, the folks who aren't in the right place at the moment, the folks who dress in furious shades of yellow. In another life, she was a banker back in the 15th century, of course, one of the ones who financed the discovery of the Americas. Those bankers learned to divest themselves of their fascination with objects, colors, and enchanted forms. They learned to let things go, these things go, so they could focus on some distant final purpose. And when the clock in the square struck eight that morning, the banker got to work in his stone house with very few adornments so that he could think without distraction. This is why when she gets up at six in the morning and does squish that scholar pen with her legs, she predicts that it will rain and she is right. It will rain so much that there's no use even bothering with an umbrella. She has no need to listen to the radio because she already knows what they're going to say and she has no need for useless repetition. She readily dismisses the knife sharpener who asks her through the intercom if she has a knife that needs sharpening. He draws out the R in sharpening, along with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Instead, she strides out purposefully to complete complicated procedures with satisfactory results and says to herself, I've made good use of my time. In another life, she was a clairvoyant, like so many others before her. Just like Cassandra, she had the gift of sight but lacked the power of persuasion. She'd quickly spit out her prophecies and pronounce them in a tiny little voice so that none of what she said could upset anyone. She took, no one took them seriously, and rightly so, because it seemed like she wasn't convinced of her own clairvoyance, like she didn't even believe in it herself, and so her prophecies seemed to forget their own vision and collect it in the corners like dust. Lately, she'd shared a couple of visions along the lines of, look, you're not going to get that money, or the words that just came out of that hole in your face are going to cause a cataclysm. But they caused so much confusion for her interlocutors that now she just lets everything wash away like so much water. What's more, she tries to stop her visions from fully forming. She prefers to see everything in its larval stage, when everything is possible, including terrible and monstrous things. 
<laughs> These things don't just seem possible, they also seem bearable. But when someone says to her with astonishment, that's terrible, she just hides behind a silly little laugh. In, for her next incarnation, she would like to be a shepherdess looking over a flock of sheep or a dog walker. <laughs> Sitting on a hill with it, while the sheep graze in the meadow, she would be able to read anything she hasn't got around to yet, which thankfully is quite a lot. She able to, she'd be able to fit her work around her reading, unlike her current situation, where all she can do is read alone in a bar with this painful feeling of futility that she's reading a book no one else understands, and even if they do, she'll never know, because it's not the kind of cafe where you sit around and discuss what you're reading. She could also happily be a dog walker. She'd learn how to organise the dogs according to size, so that they all walk along in harmony, so that they look like one living creature with lots of little legs. <laughs> How wonderful it would be to lead them along in a loose leash, every now and again feeling a tug from one dog or another as they pitter patter, pitter patter. Come along now. <laughs> so, we're done. We're done. <laughs> um, that's the, my part over. I'm just going to be serving up some questions to oh, you. Oh boy. Not just about The Last Days of Terra Nova by Manuel Rivas, which you can get, of course, at Molasses. You can get through ethical online bookstores or at your local bookstore. Um, but also, today, as we all know, it's Happy St. Jordi Day. So Thank you. here's a rose for you. <laughs> and here's a book. And so let's, let's start by some, some of us might not know exactly what St. Jordi is. It's, it's a national holiday. Uh, very no, not a holiday. Well, you know, in, in the strict sense of the term, it's a festival. A festival. Uh, that the it's, it's big in festival. Catalonia, so quite often you give a rose to someone you love and a book to someone forever, right? So let's start with some softball questions. What books have you been given as a token of appreciation before, and by whom? Well, you don't have to say. Is that a softball? <laughs> That's a softball. Yeah. Yeah. Or what books have you given as tokens of your undying love? My undying. Well, uh, I had a. I, so I, I was just in Galicia on a on a residency, and I thought, wow, I work with a lot of authors who are like better at English than I am. <laughs> it would maybe be nice to bring them, sort of either something really new or something odd that they might not have heard of. So I brought three of them, uh, books that I had personally curated, of course, for their particular tastes. Um, the first one I gave to someone was The Guest Lecture by Martin Riker, nice. uh, to which I received, he shouldn't have written a novel, he should have just written an essay. Uh, <laughs> and then I gave Dicti, um, to which I got a, I know why you gave this to me, I don't need to read it. <laughs> and then I gave uh, The Netanyahu's, and then to that I got a, this was really good. <laughs> so, one for three is pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's good, that's good. Yeah. So what are, can you think of anything you've received, whether it's been a well-received, yeah, that's the gift, question. or you know, because I think sometimes I got once got given a self-help book, which oh. <laughs> it's a very unsubtle way of being yeah. told to get your life together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. what was it? It's called the Barefoot Investor. It's this <laughs> guy from Australia who doesn't wear shoes and plays the stock market. Yeah, well, it's, uh, can I have it? Yeah, I don't think I have it anymore, yeah, no, unfortunately. Right. But, so, I don't know. I feel like I've developed a horrible reputation as someone who. I mean, it's not that it's not true, but it's like someone who. Just don't try to buy a book for me, you know, like... Well, you've been a bookseller, so one would assume you can get yeah. your hands on it. Yeah, exactly. I'm just like, don't buy me a book. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Jeff. It's it's tough, it's tough. Um, I used to give, I know, I can say this, my wife isn't here, but I used to, as a token of appreciation, Near to the Wild Heart by Clarice Lispector was one that uh, I think communicates a certain thing sometimes, but um, I think, you know, getting a nice, like, old book can be, can be good. Like, I'm sure, you know, this is my way of now getting to the last days of Terra Nova, which of course is a bookstore that didn't just carry new fancy books you can get on the high street. I'm talking, this is a book that is made up of books, right? That's true. Um, there's a lot of talk in here about um, editions of books that were published in Argentina throughout the Franco period, which were, were illegal in Spain. So. Um, Particularly in this book, there's, there's books that are published in the Galician language. Mm -hmm. um, we were texting today about, um, what's the word again? Oh, uh, there's a famous, one of the most famous books in Galicia, Ayas Morga. Which it is was, like called The Bender in English, I think. Yeah, on a, yeah, yeah. On a Bender. Three fellas, 90 pages, 
a lot of drinking, thinking about their lives. Homoeroticism. Homoeroticism. <laughs> you know, so that's nothing that the Franco regime would want to know. Well, so yeah, so he published that. Not, so he was a closeted gay man, the man who wrote it. Who's a, they actually mention him a lot in this book, yeah. um, Eduardo Blanco Amor. But he had to publish that book originally in Argentina because there was just no way for them to do that in Spain at the time that he was writing, for like the 20 years afterwards still. Yeah, and what I loved too was the, the Galicians have this big seafaring tradition, right? But um, some of the characters in this book who are sea captains or, or have friends who are, they describe themselves as contrabandists and smugglers, but they don't mean, you know, cigarettes or drugs. They're talking about books, you know, like the, the good stuff. Um, oh, yeah, that's... Did you, when you came across this book originally, I'm guessing you came across it in the, in the Galician edition, was this, were you learning about this day, this time as well, or were you sort of familiar with a lot of the, the reference points in here? Uh, ooh, I think that I, a lot of it was a learning experience in yeah. some way, especially the, actually the Argentina stuff, because there's a lot in this book about, Arge the, you know, because of that character, the woman who's from Argentina, there's like a whole section of memories of just her time and like the dictator, you know, the, the like the disappearances era of Argentina. The most I, recent dictation. Yes. <laughs> um, but I guess a lot of the Galician stuff, it's, it was nice to like, I've been doing like, I've been doing Galician stuff for like, God knows how many years now. Yeah. And the first book that I ever tried to work on was very dense with references and I didn't realize at the time that I was missing a lot of them. Uh, but now that I'm however many years in, I was like, I feel like I'm yeah. picking up on all these things that you're doing. Like he, but then the, I guess the issue with him is that so many things he's referencing are like, he'll be referencing like a Polish author. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't even know if this book has been translated into English. Absolutely. It made me think too of, you know, um, Enrique Villamantas in a way builds his novels around, you know, his is a bit more quite, quite, quite literally the words of others, whereas I found that here, you know, the Terra Nova bookstore, which is, it just, it's, even, it's more than a bookstore, it's a home for dissidents, it's, it's um, sort of an intellectual clubhouse as well, but um, I think what really shined through in this book was the, the, the love of this world and the sort of, there's a bit of a melancholy, dare I say it, saudade, <laughs> which is, I think, everyone's favourite untranslatable yeah. Portuguese word. Um, do you That's want to just give it a working definition for those who might not know Ooh. what it is? Um, I mean, I guess the like the closest English word is just nostalgia or longing. But I think I've gotten to this point where like I continually just don't translate it. And so he Manuel uses the word saudade a lot in this book because he's also very invested with Brazilian writers. But yeah, it's like a. It's like a very specific nostalgia, I guess, linked, could be linked to a person, like, I have saudades of you, yeah. like, could be linked to a place, it could, it's just this very, like, uh, amorphous, sort of, yeah, that I do. I think I love your, your book, man. So. Um, tell me a bit about the main character, who, you know, I always get confused, it's called an iron lung, this, this, the main character's had, well, oh, I guess there's a few main characters, but, um, yeah. Um, you know, one of the attributes about this main character is he overcomes a childhood, a severe case of childhood polio to sort of really throw himself into the political life that Garua leads him into. Mm -hmm. So a bit about that. Um, I guess to your earlier part of the question, Jill and I were having a little tete-a-tete -tete at the last event where we were talking about who is the, like, the centre of this book? Because sometimes yeah. it feels like you could really... I do, I do agree with you. But there's so many sort of like emotional sub centers or like sub hearts that like the father, the you know yeah. the uncle, the Garua. But the, so the main character is um, he was formerly in a metal band, uh, quote unquote. Uh, people realized that they weren't metal, he says, and they started throwing shit at their faces. But that's uh, pretty metal. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, but basically, yeah. So he grows up in an iron lung with polio. Um, and just like, you know, he, his entire life is like just what he can see out of this mirror that, like, I guess I actually don't really understand the geography or the geometry of a. I think you need a man in the iron mask with Leonardo. Like, no, no, you're like, you're in a cylinder. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, um, and so basically, once he's an adult, even, even now, like, I, I think eventually he gets over his use of crutches, but like at the very beginning of the book, he's like, basically, his bookstore is about to be sold or like bought yeah. by real estate speculators, so he finds himself needing his crutches again um but he's basically just lived a long life as like a 
In Madrid, it's not clear what he does. He's just like a guy who's like obsessed with David Bowie and like likes to. He's like, I'm a book smuggler, even though he doesn't like. Like this is like his pickup line. Like with with yeah. Garua, he's like, she like notices him because he's reading this book from Argentina, and she's like, How did you get that? And it's the like, dream that that happened. He's like, <laughs> I'm a smuggler. Like in Miami, this yeah. is like it how it is in the book. <laughs> but he does, you know, he then there's a, a moving passage where he stand, he goes, uh, I forget who is has disappeared. Right, and he goes down to Madrid and, because he's a Spaniard. This is the time that Jacob was mentioning where, um, because of the cooperation between the military dictatorship in Argentina, that Madrid was flooded with secret agents looking to get the foreign dissidents. And so, I forget exactly, is it Garugo's missing? So, so um, I guess, is this a spoiler? <laughs> Whatever, it's not really a spoiler book. So basically, like, she eventually decides to go back to Argentina, even though the implication is that she will probably die or just never make it. And, like, there's this kind of scene where his other friend is upset at him for, not, for letting her go. And so later in life, or, you know, a few years later, he goes to Madrid and starts, like, kind of trying to dig around. Mm. Um, and then he gets shoved up against the wall by some police. Within like, moments. It's like, they, they, like, yeah. break his pinky, you know? They're, like, it's very clear that they don't want him, like, trying to figure out who she, where she went. So he never actually, like, gets an answer on what happened to her. And, I mean, that, I'm not sure if it reminded you if you've read the book, but um, to me there were really strong overtones of La Maga from, from Cortázar Rachuela yes. with the character. Oh, it's been so, yeah. Yeah, but just the way, you know, there's a little bit of a... A little bit of romanticism of the of the character here. Um, she's very mysterious. She's shape shifting. She changes names. Yeah. Um, and that's again, you know, what I was sort of detecting about how this book is is so made up of other texts as well. But it's sort of mm. the way it's structured. I think maybe maybe you'd like to share a bit what happened in your tete a tete with Jill about how you feel <laughs> the structure works because it is very interesting. It doesn't go from start to finish. And no, I. Well, so the, the tete was just that I was saying, I think, uh, something to the extent that, you know, was, I think I was just expressing, like, I can't, I don't know, was, like, every day, every day I'll be, re like, I'll, I was, like, looking for a good passage to read for this other reading, and just like, oh, this is perfect, because this is the person who's really at the heart of the novel, and then I read something else, oh, this is the person who's at the heart of the novel, and then, so Jill was, was just saying that it's Garua, who's yeah. sort of like, but the reason that is, is because she's sort of, like, at the beginning of the book, he's remembering her. Like, he's looking out at the horizon, and it's, like, her that she sees. And then he, like, goes through this path of memory that takes him to, like, before he's even born, to, like, how his parents found at the bookstore, and then a lot of memories of his childhood. But then we get, like, this huge chunk of, like, how he met her, what happened to her in Argentina. Um, and then we, like, sort of go back out to the present slowly, and it turns into, like, a neo-noir novel, kind of. It's kind of crazy, but... Yeah, there's a few... He makes it work in a weird yeah, way. Like, yeah. it's kind of weird. Like, I don't know how he did it. Um, there's a few different sort of genres going yeah. at the same time, which I think is always... It's always interesting, yeah. Um, let's go down to brass tacks. <laughs> we were talking, you know, the word saudade before, how it's... It's one of those flagship words that seems to speak directly to a specific cultural concept that is not from English. And if you ever go on Twitter or translation Twitter, it's always part of those lists which are like, here's 712 different words that can't be translated. Um, I have some thoughts about it, but do you think that there is such a thing as a word or a term or a concept that can't be translated? I, I mean... Oh, it's a yes not, or no. It's a, no. <laughs> it's like, go, go. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I mean, yes is like the simple answer, but like no is the answer that practically you yeah. have to deal with. As a, you know, I guess we've gotten to a point where like no one translates saudade because we're trying to just make it easy. Like, but I guess I'm a big fan of just like if there's something that is too hard to explain in just a single word, just like add three other yeah. words to like explain that, which yeah. feels like it's like something that can be then translated. But yeah. I, I think that's sort of where I land on it too, is that maybe there isn't a word-for-word -word equivalent, but um, yeah. I think to me that's also part of the project of translation, is yeah. it's saying that they're, we are feeling and thinking the same things. I did just realize though that actually just the past few weeks I've decided that there's a word I might stop translating in Galicia because it's so... <laughs> which is it? Which it's is so it? annoying. Uh, it's the word aldea, yeah. which is, it's like in Spanish too, you have this thing of like the pueblo, the yeah. town, but it is just used in this way that like cannot ever be conveyed by like any single word in English of like town, because it's like 
when you say Aldea, what you're really talking about is where your grandparents are from, you know, like... And like, you know you've made it when with the Spanish friends are like, do you want to come to, the, to my pueblo? And you're like, <laughs> but I, so I was talking, so I had this other Galician writer that I was just with in London. He wrote a memoir about his, he was born in London because his, his grandmother emigrated there. But he grew up in, in a small town in Galicia. And so as a, as a kid, like when he goes to school in Galicia, he learns what the word aldea is. And he's like, what does that mean? They're like, it's where your grandparents live. So aldea means like tiny little hamlet. And so he's like, oh, my grandma lives in London. So yeah. like London is my little <laughs> tiny hamlet because like that. So yeah, it's yeah. just like there's so much faith into it that yeah. I'm like, maybe my act of resistance as a translator is to teach people the word aldea. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. tired of trying to just say hamlet just doesn't really work for me either in, it's in bit, American it's English. Bit, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can do things too over a long book where you might explain it. Right. Once and then, um, I noticed. So lazy. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed too in here, you know, when the Argentinian characters get together, of course, they start drinking mate, which mm. that's been the bane of my existence because <laughs> it looks like mate. Oh, I put an accent on it because yeah. it was bothering me so much. Yeah, and then, but then Argentinian scene, like, there's no accent. I know. I, yeah, I did it sort of and was like, I hope yeah. 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 It, but I also think I might have put it on the wrong. Letter, if we're gonna like be thinking, oh, yeah, that's all right. That's yeah. okay. That can be for editions five through ten. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> can you, can you, I'm gonna, I'll go through all these. <laughs> I love with Alea, would you do you have anything off the top of your head that with thorny passages? And, and do you talk us through how you your project do you sort of plow through once, fix it in post? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I so I for a lot for like a, a couple of years, I worked for this. Uh, it's like, it was like a, you know, they write content articles in Spanish, like, Plato's 10 best quotes, or, you know, like, um, 712 words, you can't, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, and so they just paid so poorly for the Spanish, for the English translations that I was like, the only way for this to like become a somewhat worthwhile endeavor is just to do it in one go. Yeah. And so like, I just learned to do it. So like now I do edit a lot. I didn't edit that. Do it a lot, but yeah, I just like I feel like I'm. I also am a child of like the Bush era, where it's like you're taking a standardized test. If you don't know the answer, just move, like flag it and move on. No. You know? Is that where that comes? From? Yes, yes, seriously, that was like drilled into into oh, yeah. our I think our brains. But so yeah, I'm like it's not worth just like getting bogged down and like I can look up something and if it's not coming in like five minutes, I got like yeah, let's like make it out of it. Yeah, yeah, um, and so. Passages? Though? Yeah, or was there a particular, ca you know, there's, we mentioned there's a few different characters, mm -hmm. like there's a metalhead, there's a drug dealer, there's not, like, did the voices come across in the original Galician in ways that were difficult to render individual on the page? They definitely come across in Galician. Yeah. Actually, I just, I'll segue this into it. So, one of the things that happened to me while I was in Galicia is that uh, I started hearing people say this phrase that I'd only ever read in a Manuel Rivas book, <laughs> which was like, they, they will say, um, Chateauveo, which just is like, it's, it's rained. What they're saying is like, it's been a long time because it rains so much in Galicia that it's like, oh, it's rained quite a bit since we last saw each other. Uh, but for the longest time, I just thought, oh, it's like Manuel being poetic. Yeah. And whatever. <laughs> this is actually just like the most colloquial thing. Like, I, I suddenly go there and I'm like, I've been there, I spent like two years there and yeah. never noticed it. And then suddenly I go back after reading a Manuel Rivas book. So I actually am not. It's almost as if life and literature are one. <laughs> but I'm not disappointed that I translated it somewhat literally. Yeah. Because I feel like it's still conveyed. Yeah. Um, you know what? It's been a minute. Yeah. Yeah, but it's like no. No, it was no. Like, you won. Yeah. yeah, it was like I just translated it as something like it's rained a lot since then, or something. You know, just so people really moody Galician vibes. It does. You know, I the, I was telling some of the people in the audience at the first book. I translated from Spanish was actually by a writer of Galician background. The book was set there, and there was oh, a lot of yeah. yeah. So there were a lot of things too about specific terms around you know the sort of fireplace and the hearth. Yeah, and there is a lot of sort of fog and mud and scratching. It's like interior too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, those are sorts of things that I think are really interesting to to bring across. Yeah. Um, well, and that's so sorry. This is the point I guess I was trying to make is that uh, I've also had this confirmed for other from other people in case you don't trust my knowledge, but 
uh, Manuel, like he's he's known for just having an an amazing ear for like Galician speech. So in terms of like the dialect, he just has this really snappy. Like he knows the colloquialisms. He knows how to like employ them. Like you really can't. You, there's no one else in Galician who writes Galician sort of like daily speech as well and as beautifully. Like somehow he manages to do them both. Well, maybe that's a good point to ask you how you came across this book and his work, and if you know then. We're... You worked with him on this. It's so romantic. Is that how you bought it online? <laughs> no. I uh, uh, I'll just uh, yeah. So I, I just kind of cold reached out to Jill. Like you guys have published a Basque book and a Catalan book. Where's the Galician? <laughs> uh, and I and then she says, well, I've always wanted to publish something by Manuel Rivas. Is there anything that hasn't been translated? And the answer is that most of his fiction has already yeah. been translated. I think nine books by Penguin. Uh, in the UK, so this is the his, this was his newest novel at the time. So I went to the library. I was living in Galicia at the time, mm -hmm. so I went to the library, um, and I guess that I mean that's sort of I hadn't. I did I, you get in touch with him? Was you working? Well, yeah. well, this is weird. Uh, oh, as I was working on it. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I would ask him questions. He was always very forthcoming. He sent me also the Spanish version. Uh, which is nice sometimes to have like the other translation just because if there's like a word like Galician is a very badly dictionary language the like main normative dictionary is kind of horrible for a lot of things and like just a lot of words are missing because they refuse to acknowledge the existence of like yeah regional speech or like you know god forbid but um and he really respects his Spanish translator as well. So he was like, there would be like changes. And I'm like, am I supposed to like go with the Spanish? It's like different yeah, than yours. Yeah. He was like, ah, just do it. Like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I so think yeah, that, he was, yeah. he's, he's very joyous to work with. That, that sends a hug. That sort of layered thing of versions upon versions, I think, is really interesting too now. Um, I, I'm, you know, with, someone was talking about Kafka and um, the just the sheer quantity of Kafka translations you can go and find that are. Kind of crazily different, yeah. Um, but I think yeah, being able to have to you know speak with someone who's actually written is good. I've I've had the experience of writing to an author who wrote you know a particularly sort of poetic novel, and I've said you know I said I've been looking at this for about two weeks. I just don't really know what it means, <laughs> and he said. Oh, I don't really know either. It's more like, <laughs> it's like it's the mood of it, right? And yeah, I'm like, yeah, just I'm like it out. great. I'm just yeah. I could have asked you this two weeks ago, but. Um, yeah. Uh, I think you know that's what's that's what's exciting about r working with living writers, right? Yeah, and the like Galician authors are without fail just very warm and like uh, he's like he's someone who he probably knows more English than he sort of allows, but like he really doesn't need or want to like see it. He's very just like you're doing you like I'm happy like I I don't know why he trusts me, but you know here we are. Yeah. Um, Wait, so how, how did the poetic translation go? Um, it was good. I mean, it was... But did you end up asking him any questions once you knew that it was he didn't know what anything meant? Uh, yeah. I mean, I left it all the things till the very end, basically. I wasn't sort okay, of bugging yeah. him all the way through. Yeah, I was yeah, sort of yeah. trying to figure it all out as much as I could. And then it was just a couple of thorny things. But then, then it was quite nice to be told, you know, go with it, make it a mood. Right, just do whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah like have fun with it. Um, that's probably enough questions from me. Would you like to answer some questions from our friends? Sure. Does so anyone have any questions for Jacob? Yeah, for uh, both of you. Uh oh, well, you could. I'll go first, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I mean because the, oh, uh, all right. Oh, one, one question, one question. For both of them. Yes. yes. Uh, one question is: Were you tempted to translate? I mean, or to explain Garua? Because that's it's like a misty rain. And I'm asking you that knowing, I think the MAGA parallel is brilliant and, and nobody ever explains that MAGA means magician. So, mm. Mm. But, but, the, but the fact that her name is this meteorological phenomenon is kind of interesting. You would like, uh, I think it's untranslatable, but I said. Yeah, that's <laughs> like, the thing is like once you. You wouldn't want to call be, it drizzle, would you? Right, you just, oh, no, yeah. no, you wouldn't translate her name. No. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's, you kind of just got to hope that it comes a click, because it does, I think, her vibe i guess mm -hmm. comes off on the page but yeah it's like you can't yeah i mean you can't uh, you can't explain it or like you know if you translate her name it just becomes a little uh like it's like you either have to translate every name so like there's a guy like there's a guy in, there's a guy in well no there's a guy in the book uh one of the thugs i guess who's like coming to 
burn the bookstore down, and his name is it in Italian, which is also, I mean, what the hell? Uh, Bocca di fumo, you know, smoke mouth, like, what are, <laughs> or like fire breather, yeah. but like, it's just, you know, like... No, I didn't mean that you would translate the oh, name, sorry. but but explain explain it, but but you can, I, I think you can. I, I think too, you know, having had a bit of experience working, when I was working with a magazine where our focus was on translation and literature from abroad, um, I think that there's a bit of fear that the reader can't meet you at least halfway. So, you know, I think the sort of person who's going to pick this book up and be interested in it might jump on Google anyway and, and have a look at some of these things. Um, and I think that's definitely something that, as I was reading this, I'm doing it. I have know, to. But, you know, I'm, I'm finding all these books that are mentioned, then I'm looking into this movie called, you know, The Three Day Bender, then I'm seeing the two different <laughs> film versions. Yeah, the new one's really good. Yeah, um, and I think that we're living in a hyperlinked reading space now where yeah. as much, you know, I love just as much as anyone else to grab a ceramic mug of red wine and sit down by the fire with my <laughs> phone in the other room, but um, I think, you know, all these sorts of things, um, they reward the curious reader, and I think the sort of person who comes to these events, who buys his book, is the curious reader. That actually was a was a secondary tertiary question, I, but I I wanted to comment that I thought it was really lovely the passage that you chose because it, that character in Ebe Ubat could be Garua, yeah. <laughs> and I, and it was just a beautiful also, juxtaposition. I just would love to say to someone that I'm like Matt. I don't know. This will never happen for me, but like. The hole on your face is like yeah. it's going to cause a cataclysm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the nice sort of mysterious thing that you know, they'd walk away without knowing if they'd been insulted or <laughs> flirted with or you know. So, yeah. I read um, some comments by uh, a translator, and it really struck me. I'm, I'd like to know your reaction. The translator was saying, "You know, you shouldn't translate." everything. When English speakers are reading a passage and they're talking about colors and they talk about puce, most people don't know what puce is. But you don't have to translate it. It's just conveying that here's this color. And it's not green, yellow, red, it's puce. Mm. And, and the same principle is good in translating. Don't worry yeah. if people don't get everything. Because it's the bigger thing they're getting. What I, I do you mean, think? yeah, I, you know, I, when I was a very young man backpacking through Europe, that's when I decided to take Ulysses with me because I thought there's no way I'm ever going to get through this thing. It's crazy. Unless there's any nothing else to do. Which so, Ulysses? <laughs> Which one? Uh, James Joyce. Which one? Yeah. Just want to make sure. And I was on a train in the Balkans. You know, no internet. This is, I was no, and I actually found it to be. Exactly what you're explaining there, you know, did I get every single reference on the page? No. Yeah. Did I stop when I didn't get it? No. And then you get an overall feeling that is atmospheric and I think that's the same as, that's how painting works, it's how symphonic music works. Um, and I think that, that literature is part of that conception of art as well. You know, if, you, if you're reading a, a catalogue for an exhibition, you probably don't want to have too many words, you don't know what they are, you know, if you're describing a piece of art and that doesn't make any sense. But I think in a novel we can get into this aesthetic space that is, um, that is more than just literal. Yeah. What do you think? That was a good answer. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I remember um, for a while I would, especially with, because plants too, I think, can be like this when they're something not native to wherever we're from, so we're not used to seeing this name. So many references in Galicia to, to plants that I'll then look up and be like, well, yes, I see that this is a thing. <laughs> what is gorse? Like, you know, and, and so. It's but, in England, gorse. Yeah. And that's, well, so I guess that's where I'm going with this is my, my instinct then was just to say, oh, God, this is making this so impenetrable. Everyone's going to hate this because this word gorse is just on the page. And then I had two realizations. One, sort of in line with what you're saying, that yeah. it's fine, but also, two, that like, other people know things that I don't it's just because like I don't know what it means particularly it doesn't mean that like right. as long as I like it's it's there it's like it's, I can't change the plant also but you know yeah like I I'm a, I know very little actually and like, I have the opposite when I say eucalypt I think well what kind of eucalypt? <laughs> <laughs> you're, just, uh, you're you're the ideal Galician reader oh, I don't know about that um yeah I think that's a really good way I that's a really good way of putting it that people do know so much and more than we know that um, 
People read a lot of books. Yeah. <laughs> they encountered, like, I bet someone in here has read a book other than this one where Gorse, I'm sure Gorse is referenced in here, but I'm sure that someone else has read a book here yeah. in translation. Absolutely. Gorse. Yeah. Um, this is a question for both of you. Um, what, what do you feel like you each have taken away as, as translators after translating your books and how do you feel like you know, you've grown as translators after, or I guess in, pro in process of, mm. you know, translating. Do you want to go first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, I think I have been doing it for a while alongside, uh, I'm a journalist, I'm a fiction writer of my own. And what I, and I've done, I've done ghostwriting, speechwriting, copywriting, anything, right? So what you get with translation is you get to be completely inside someone else's style. So I've never translated a book that I would say is necessarily written the way that I write. And I think that's something that's really, it's bizarre and fantastic and rewarding. I've mm -hmm. learned things about how I want my own writing to be, but it's also, I will admit it's quite nice to then close the book and send it to the editor mm -hmm. and then you you yeah. you can do something else um, and that's something that I think is really wonderful is to get just so close to, I, I was in this discussion too where you know we were talking about that author of mine who, who sort of was writing by mood and wasn't paying you know when you're translating you have to go word by word every single word when when you I I've edited books where you get up to page 483 and you you know, the eyes get a bit tired, you know, and as a reader sometimes, I've skimmed, I will admit that. Not this book, of course, but... Oh, no, um, no, no, no. Um, Actually, there's this, every reference. There's this <laughs> closeness with translation that I think is super, super tight. I like the closeness thing. Uh, I, uh, with this book, I don't, I don't know. I think that my biggest thing was like, it came, I think especially once it came, maybe when I was looking at proofs, and so often, like, after I've finished something and I read it again, like, God, oh, God, like, I want to change it, and I'm just, it's full of regret. But, like, with this, I really actually felt, like, peace. And I was like, wow, I, I did that? Like, that's cool. And a lot of that has to do with my well-being, like, a really greater writer than I could ever have to. Like, and the excellent job that Archipelago Books did. Also, <laughs> also. Yeah. Um, I think in some ways, too, like, if I had translated this book, like, five years ago, I probably wouldn't have done like, I don't think that I would have been ready. Yeah. But that's partly of Maybe not true. Every time I translate a book or translate something, I think that I've learned something new about translation and I've learned the definitive thing about yeah. translation. Like, I get it now. I know what it's all about. Oh, yes. And then I start something else and I'm like, I don't know anything. Yeah. God, like, what am I doing? And then, you know, I finish that and I'm like, I figured it out. But you get this reward. Yeah, no, yeah. it's nice to just yeah. realize, you know, you're having a new and meaningful experience with sort of every book. Ideally, every book that you work on, and they are, you know, they. It's probably a cliche, but they're all different. You know, it's not. Uh, Ideally, they. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. You don't want me to translate the same book a second time, but, um, and I think to the, you know, the approach. Within the translation world, there's lots of schools and pitched battles and things like that. But for me, I think, the way you approach translating it has to, be tailored to the book at hand. You know, um, and it's also going to be very different if you're doing. If you're doing a book from 300 years ago where there are five translations already, you, yeah. that's going to be different from doing something when you can jump on email and speak to Manuel and he's got all the time in the world for you. you know? Yeah, well, I'm actually curious what you think about this because this came up a few years ago at a panel. The idea, too, that if someone hasn't been translated before, you have like a different prerogative as a translator, especially if they're living, then, then you do for someone who, you know, like a classic that like it's been done, like no yeah. one particular, no one quote unquote needs your thing. So you're maybe a little more free to take it and make it yours. I think, I think you know, the other reality of my experience in translation is it's always been tied to a project from a publisher. It's, mm -hmm. There are some people who will start working on something just from love of it or as part of a PhD program. But what I mean by that is I've always had a specific context. So, mm -hmm. so for example, when I'm translating for an Australian publisher, even at a sentence level, the language is going to look a little bit different. Um, if you're publishing something for, say, Archipelago, where it's a series or where the books look the same, we know what an Archipelago book is, I think you can, again, you know, this is what I talk about, like, asking the reader to meet you in a certain place. Um, I've done... I did one for a 
Nobel Prize winning Peruvian author who has since become a little bit compromised in his political <laughs> views, but um, this book was a, it was a novella about the children's crusade that in this big deal got sort of rebranded in English translation, it was going to be a young reader's book. Mm -hmm. This is a book about ghosts and lepers and all kinds of things that were not that. And so the approach, you know, when I turned in my draft, they were like, we're going to rewrite this character to be, to be more relatable oh, and likable. And that's, you know, that's oh, a different yeah. thing altogether. But, that's but, an uncomfortable uh, position to be in. I, 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 that, got, yeah. that got a little kill fee, that project. But, yeah. um, <laughs> what I mean is that I think that I'm very, I don't really believe in this idea of this nebulous translation space that where you could where there is a right or wrong approach it's going to be always there's always a context i think so and i agree with you if, if you're doing the, the third or fourth bologna there's a bologna world going right but if you do it the first time maybe you have to explain a bit of, of what that is did you look at other rivas translations like not of this book into the spanish but i mean of these other novels translated into english oh no because i well because also like so the, the man who translated them all is like, uh, like, I read a lot of his work, but with this, I was like, I, I feel like that we're it's gonna have different yeah. voices and I'm gonna, you know, this is that classic thing where you're worried that like, you're gonna be contaminated by the other yeah. persons and you're gonna lose your sense of what you're, um, but I have read them so like, uh, I started reading the Carpenter's Pencil and was very much enjoying it in English. So. Yeah. We're, we're actually texting today about that, though, that you know, well, when you're in the thick of it, you know, I, I was sort of saying um, about this other book, had, had you read it and, and you sort of said I was in such in translator mode that I didn't haven't read it because it's already been translated into English and therefore it's not a professional candidate. And I said, yeah. I have a thing too where I'll pick up a book in a language that I, and I can't help myself from, instead of just enjoying the novel, I'll start translating it in my head. <laughs> and then, then it's not fun, you know. Oh, I have fun when I do that. Yeah. It feels, I'm like, this is what I- Oh, you I enjoy mean, this, Jacob? Well, yeah, because it's like, I don't have to put the words on the page. I'm having fun with the in-between yeah. space and no one else knows about it and we're gonna move on and I'm gonna forget about it. Yeah. And that's sort of depressing sometimes, but it's also nice in the moment. Yeah. Like, so I think of a solution to something or I think of I, the sentences in my head and I'm like, oh, well, uh, goodbye. I could try to do it on the page right then, and it will never work. So I just try to enjoy it. So you, you're I better on the page it. than in your head? Oh, I think I'm better in my head than on better the page. On the and that's why I'm like, just savor that. I feel It feels very empowering. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. No, I get that. That's cool. Does anyone else have any questions? Do you guys ever translate poetry? I guess, um, how do you feel about the, uh, the words? You know, your answers earlier seemed like they were geared towards prose translation, um, you know, words that are hard to translate, um, how do you approach those in poetry? Uh, is your approach any different with, you know, words that are much more complex when in translation? Um, I, so I, there's actually an interview that I just saw today with a poet and translator that I really love, Robin Myers, who works a lot with Spanish, and she said something that I, because I'll hear people often say, uh, like, oh, I don't translate poetry because poetry, like, ooh, scary. Um, but she, she basically said this thing because she translates both and she's like, I don't find the difference in terms of translation all that fundamentally interesting in terms of just like the sort of the challenges that they pose. Because in, I should also say like, I don't translate ever poetry that has a meter or anything. So it's a lot easier if you're just translating three lines. So yeah, I think that I kind of approach it the same. And like, if, if the structure all of a sudden gets changed, like maybe just add another line. Uh, so that we're still compact. <laughs> Don't tell me. Oh, yeah. um, I would have said a similar thing that I haven't done any metric, and I think that would be a, a challenge. Um, one of my favorite writers from Chile, Nicanor Parra, has, he wrote this sort of extraordinary translation of King Lear into Chilean Spanish, in, in sort of keeping the, almost keeping the iambic pentameter. That's, that's sort of, he was a bit of a polymath genius but He's a genius, him. yeah, yeah. Um, I think yeah I think that'd, that'd be a different thing as well same as I think I've, I've never done um, plays but I think there you'd, you'd be wanting to pay attention to you know sort of different things that what you're doing in a novel not completely different but I think there's that form does sometimes ask you to emphasize different
coming to spend St. Jody with us. Thank you to Matt and the team at Molasses as well. Thank you, Matt, as always. Thank you, Sarah. I, I, I would like to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Sam. Oh, yeah. But I want to tell a little bit about St. George. Um, probably all of you know about it, but of course it's the Feast of St. George, the Dragon Slayer. And um, for centuries it was celebrated as the Dragon Slayer, the, the gentleman gives the lady a rose. And in the 1920s, the, Catalan, the Barcelona Booksell, Booksellers Guild began to introduce books into the mix. And that's why it became the Day of Books and Roses in, in Barcelona, and then all throughout Catalonia. So you should buy a book and give it to someone you love and take a rose when you leave. Okay. And thank you. Thank, thank you to everybody at Archipelago for because this was just a whole extra work in the in the middle of, of all of your other work. And thank thank Matt. Molasses is a, just a gorgeous place. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.